been trying to get this thing done for uh it seems like weeks now and had some hernia complications and you're like oh i've been through that so you actually <laughs> had hernias too uh yeah that's why i left the military too it was uh back and and knee injuries and uh i had the back fuse but really been dealing with it for 10 or 12 years and uh it just never goes away i don't really know uh, mm. how, how to fix it but uh i feel your pain yeah so you you have the hernia now but you just never got it fixed no no no, no. i've uh um, I've had herniated discs in the past and I've had oh. them used and I've had surgeries too. And okay. I done like six rounds of physical therapy in the 10 years, but I just uh -huh. mean, you know, I, I think the back pain never really goes away once you, once you start getting <laughs> it. And it's, you know, I imagine, uh, avid hunters like yourself, outdoorsmen probably have similar injuries to the infantry guys. And, and most of us have the exact same injuries. They're all oh. herniated discs in the lower back. Okay, yeah, so I have that too, uh, L4, L5. Yep. I've done two rounds of injections, and uh, and actually I was doing physical therapy for my back when that's how I discovered I had hernias because it wasn't getting better, and then I was telling my physical therapist, I was like, dude, it hurts in the front of like my abdomen. It's yep. like, then you just have tight hip flexors, so then I'm doing planking, and you know core exercises which is just exacerbating these three holes in my abdomen so so yeah so i got the hernias fixed and then they're still bothering me so actually i had a um sonogram done and now i'm waiting for results of an mri because the guy the doctor was like i can't see any complications like the hernias look healed so now he's like let's just do let's look at the mri and See what's going on. But uh, the back pain, dude, I don't know. Did the injections help you at all? No. So I did three series of them. And uh, at the time, too, I had a surgeon who was like, this guy's got to go in. At the at the time when I went in and they wanted to do uh, these injections, the the disc had slipped and was sitting on the sciatic nerve. So mostly what it was doing is it was making my leg feel like, like it was yeah. on fire all the time. I don't know if you experienced that yet but the nerve pain that comes with back pain is pretty wild yeah. too mostly in my so, left butt cheek <laughs> yeah like my glute feels irritated at all times yeah mine it'll run down like the the right side of my right leg and it'll mm -hmm. just drive me crazy especially if i'm standing too long but you know the best advice i could give is uh i, I lost the weight uh i was about 30 pounds heavier when i left the military than i am now and that helped out a lot. And and I, I had a buddy who was a D defensive line at West Point, uh, infantry guy too. He, he obviously he was I think like two ten when he was in West Point. He slimmed down too, and he was like, man, all, all I do these days is the elliptical, hang out in the pool, do a little ice bath. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we're getting old. We gotta yeah. You know, the, and I, you know, I, I still like the lift, but. You just mm -hmm. have to be so much more careful because it's not worth it. So the 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 back doctor, um, he has told me I need spinal fusion or there's one other surgery, but I don't know. I've talked to a lot of people and they're like that the, that's just the first back surgery. So I don't know if yeah. you've had to have another one. I've just had it fused since then. Okay. Um. You know, I've gone in and, and looked at what the other options are, but they, 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 outside of surgery, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of them. You know, there's like a little chip, I think, that you could put in that, um, you know, sends like radio waves or does something like, you know, helps with the pain. But I don't know, those, that, that kind of sounds crazy to me to put mm -hmm. a chip in that I like control with the remote. But I mm -hmm. guess it's not that much different from a, a tibula or whatever that. Mm -hmm they put in the heart is pacemaker uh, well he did say there's one other like injection where they it's, it's an injection type thing but really they're going in and just burning the nerves but that that's a temporary relief thing it's all temporary your back's jacked you're just kind of screwed so and that's why i like uh you know i've got some good ice packs i try to take care of it uh try to do less crazy things than i was doing when i was younger hmm. Let's see yeah that's yeah. The best yeah. Oh, that's where I first figured out I had back problems was about 
I'd say I've been dealing with it for 20 years, like, but it's just, you know, gotten worse and worse. Um, but when I was backpacking, um, like, you know, for a week in New Mexico, it's like, yeah, my back is something's wrong here. And then you don't deal with it cause you're young. Mm-hmm. And then, and then like, you know, 15 years later, you're like, this really is uncomfortable. It's a, I don't know. I feel bad for everyone that has to deal with back pain, but uh enough for this woe is me we're still here and life isn't that bad um so your dad was in the military uh was that a path that you you always knew you wanted to take not because it was my dad but yeah my dad and my grandfather both both served in the air force mm-hmm. my path started really because of 911 saw it in a high school classroom and I had a core group of friends, uh, kind of like-minded buddies. We went to, to ASU, but three out of the four of us knew we were going to serve. One went in immediately and after high school into the Marine Corps. And then me and my roommate did ROTC at ASU, uh, went in and commissioned. Mm. But I think I always, uh, maybe I had my father my grandfather instilled a sense of service my uncle served in vietnam on my mom's side too uh so lots of family members who did serve and saw the importance of serving and and the value too i think had an impact on me but yeah i was really 9 11 and then when i got to asu too learned a lot about who pat Tillman was and 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 that's kind of the route that i took within the army Hmm. okay yeah both of my uh grandfathers served in world war ii And my dad got drafted for Vietnam, but when he had his physical, they found a hole in his heart. So actually saved his life. He wasn't, you know, he didn't get to go to Vietnam, which was probably a blessing for him um, because of that condition. So next thing he was having open heart surgery and he's, he's fine, but they found that during his, uh, his physical. Um, So you went to ASU, um, then joined the army. And what, what was the, what was your career path in the, in the army? Yeah. Uh, I was an infantry officer. Oh, welcome you to the big me? 12, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I appreciate it. We'll, we'll see. Um, exciting. I think we needed a change, right? We've been yeah. like stagnant in the lower half for, uh, for a long time. <laughs> um, and so I hope that it, it motivates our players and coaches, you know, we've had some shakeups in the, in the last few years at ASU. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, what, well, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, I don't remember. It's now I'm thinking about college football. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, no, uh, uh, just your, you know, when you got out of ASU and in your path in, uh, in oh, the yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I was, I was really motivated, wanted to be an infantryman. Uh, and, and how that works in ROTC is, is, and West Point is pretty interesting. I don't know if many people know this, but it's almost, it's a draft system. So you spend basically your entire time in ROTC and West Point building up this profile of who you are, right? And it, it break it, it, during my time, it was broken into three categories, leadership, which can be kind of outside ROTC or West Point, but includes some of it a physical uh, and then mental. So what they were looking at is obviously your PT scores, but there were other things too, ruck marches and your performance at a at a camp um, that both West Point and ROTC run between your junior and senior year. And then your your GPA or your performance in school. And so they take mm-hmm. those three things and then you put your top five branches that you want to go to, whether it's infantry, aviation, armor, military intelligence, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And then the branches draft you, uh, for lack of a better term. So they, they, huh. they, there are different rules that they have to play by, but they pick them. And so for you, you already sign up for this four or five year commitment and you have no idea what your job is going to be. So uh, hmm. it's pretty exciting. Uh, at, at West Point, they put together a whole event, a ceremony, and it's called Branch Day. Uh, in ROTC, it was, it was less formal. But there was uh, definitely a lot of partying afterwards and excitement. Um, And so that's how I ended up in the infantry. I put it as number one. I knew it's exactly where I wanted to go. I worked hard uh, and got the branch that I wanted. Uh, Then you go off and you go into a series of schools as an infantry officer. Uh, At the time, there was like a, a deployment course that you would take. 
did that in Oklahoma, went to Fort Benning to go to the infantry school and then airborne and ranger school. And then almost immediately afterwards, uh, went to my unit, went to the national training center. And I'd say, I think I graduated ranger school in July and was in Iraq by December. So that's how fast the tempo was back mm. then too. Uh-huh. Okay. So what is that mindset like for an infantryman? Be like, I want to be the guy on the ground engaging with the enemy. I wondered, I, I thought about it. it makes me think you have fast. a screw loose, to be honest with you. <laughs> I think it's a screw loose for sure. Uh, but there's also a lot of competition internally within, you know, ROTC or, or whatever. And, uh, and, and that sometimes is what drives me. I, I want it to be the best. Um, but at the same time, I didn't, um, I, I thought that it fit my skill set. I, you know, I played sports in, in high school, I, I, well, I mean, I played sports all my life, but in high school too. And I thought, uh, you know, the infantry just, just is where I wanted to be was my home. Hmm. I agree with you. You do have a screw loose too. I mean, most of those guys, and, and I, I was one of them, that's where my uh, career kind of ended, you know, volunteer over and over again and, and want to do more of this and want to become more experienced and want to become you know, uh, stronger within, in their branch and in their profession at these, that the things that they do. Um, I don't know, maybe it's an addiction. You, you uh, I really got into it in the same way. I, I think that you, you get into your hunting too, but you can get into becoming a, a professional in the profession of arms and turn it into, you know, a, a skill, uh, uh, like, like I said, your, your career and your profession, but you know, it's fun too. Hmm. And there so you were, were you were in Iraq in 2007? Eight and nine. Okay. Okay. And how many deployments did you do? I did one. Yeah. And and that actually comes, you know, back to what we were talking about before is the, the injuries, once they start and, and the domino effect happens, uh, the, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Yeah. What was the most uh, eye-opening thing? that you didn't expect, uh, you know, during your time deployed? Yeah, I think you expect the, you know, the kinetic fight. I think you expect to be uh, living in, in terrible conditions. What I guess I didn't, what I didn't expect was seeing the way the Iraqis lived and how much different it was from America. Um, it was shocking to me how I was, I was in the second largest city. We were living in a combat outpost in the middle of it. Um, and, and I would say that the majority of homes, uh, you know, didn't have anyone working. Uh, and that maybe, you know, was a product of, of, of the war as well, but there was also not a lot of indoor plumbing. And I would see these pictures in some of the homes uh, that we were in from the 1960s and 1970s, and it looked so much like America. And so it was shocking to me that they've either gone backwards or not moved at all since the 1970s. Hmm. And then it so, you know, it made me wonder why. And I think that that's um, a complicated question, but uh, an interesting one to think about, too. Mm -hmm. And so what was a typical day like uh, for you while you're at this combat, uh, combat outpost? We would usually do two missions a day. You'd uh, go out and um, I was there during two different campaigns. So Operation Iraqi Freedom, which was counterinsurgency, and then Operation New Dawn, we had transitioned to becoming the Army's first advise and assist battalion. So we're helping the Iraqi Army and police force really take over operations there. So there was a little bit of a difference of, of operations between the, the changeover between those two. But when we were living out at the combat outpost, we were usually going out during the day, uh, doing winning the hearts and the minds missions. We do humanitarian aid drops or we'd bring a, a civil affairs officer with us and we'd look at ways to improve. Uh, I had a town called Zinjali in, in uh, that northwestern part of Missoul. That was my AO. So we would meet with the Mukhtars and the Sheiks, uh, get an idea of what's going on uh, that week or, or that day in the, in the town. 
then we'd go back to our combat outpost for a little bit and then we usually went out at night and either that was uh, a, a, a follow-on mission a you know a, a regular uh raid or we would patrol around and and act as you know kind of deterrence they would usually put their ieds in in the evening so you know we would do what i think soldiers came to hate which were presence patrols in the evening because of the the chance of getting blown up well i think soldiers want to go on a mission that has you know a very specific defined purpose right go grab this guy i don't think that they want to drive around and you know uh become a target yeah and and i i I didn't either but i understood that it also us being out there uh, was an at, what, what was an actual deterrent to you know insurgents having the the opportunity to go you know dig a hole and put an ID in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm assuming that you were shot at. Yeah, I mean we were uh, in a number of of different types of engagements. Firefights weren't the most common that we were facing. We had a lot of IEDs. I think more than an average number of V-bids. Uh, the soldiers that we lost, the majority of them were were to V-bids too. And what then there's uh, the vehicle-borne improvised explosive device, car bombs. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, and then there was a new tactic. They were using Russian RKG-3 grenades. Uh, we had these grenades um, create an, an EFP, uh, and have a parachute that comes out. So they, they would throw them over tanks, right? And then they would float down and then it would form, you know, they would explode and form an EFP. And then that was an uh, anti-armor projectile that would that would uh, destroy the vehicle. So they were like using that on our Humvees and on us. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was especially effective because we had strikers attached to us as well. And uh, th- those things don't have as, as strong as armor. So... Those were the attacks we normally saw, but my first engagement was a was a firefight. Huh. Wow. And so, I mean, I obviously I love shooting animals. Uh, I don't, I don't I can't imagine actually pulling the trigger on a human being. Um, but I don't know. Was that something that that keeps you up at night, or just something that you know? Hey, that was part of the job, and it, I don't really think about it. That part isn't. Uh, what I think about a lot. Uh, we lost 10 guys while we were there and uh, I medevaced all of them. And so I, that's the, those are the memories that, mm. that really haunt me. Uh, no, uh, honestly, the, I, I, got, I remember, and I think you'll, you'll appreciate when I was in, in the first firefight, it's more, what I thought was so shocking is you go through training all the time and throughout the training, they're like, Hey, they're going to be shooting at you, but you're going to run towards it anyway. Right. That's basically, (laughs) uh, you know, I've, I always found it really funny. Um, you know, the best way to get yourself out of an ambush is to go directly at the people ambushing you. Right. And I always thought that that was, um, you know, a funny military tactic that you don't expect in the very beginning, but, Mm. but, uh, yeah, they had uh, set up a little machine gun position on top of a roof and they were firing down at our Humvee and uh, we were firing back. And in my head, I'm like, there are bullets going right by you. And it, like, you're just going to stand here and just hope one of them doesn't hit you. And like, th- and, and I know that we train like that all the time. And I knew that that's what I was doing. But in the moment when I'm like, no, I'm just going to like keep my head here and I'm going to keep firing at the enemy. Right. Like. That that was uh, that it it was just a weird feeling to me that you would mm. you know continue to just put yourself in arms right and then you maneuver on them then you move forward and um and and that's I don't think just a a natural human decision to make run towards danger right yeah uh huh um so you were awarded a, a bronze star and army uh, combination medal with valor. Yeah, I, I, we did have a really difficult deployment. Uh, that was the Bronze Star. And the Army Commendation Medal uh, was originally, I was recommended for a Bronze Star with Valor. And 
we weren't awarded these medals until we came home a few months into it. And it was reduced down to an Army Commendation Medal with Valor. Uh, the story there was uh, during that transition, like I said, from Operation Iraqi Freedom to Operation New Dawn, um, the Iraqis were trying to make it as, I'm sorry, Al Qaeda was trying to make it as painful as they possibly could for the Americans while they were there. Mm -hmm. And you could understand this is, you know, they were trying whenever Iraq and America sign this new status of forces agreement, they want, you know, it to be as unfavorable to America as possible. They don't, they, they want America had a limited mobility within the country, right? They were trying to limit the United States's um, ability to operate within Iraq during that time. So they were going after officers, specifically American officers. And uh, a lot of the times they were using, like I said, these V-bids. And so on the day, uh, we had a striker platoon attached to us. And the striker platoon was going out of the, we were going out of the Ford operating base. And the way Missoula was set up at the time is you had the U.S. compound kind of on an inner circle. And on the outer circle, you had an Iraqi army compound. Uh, and, and at the front of that was the barracks, the, the headquarters. Uh, most of your Iraqi army buildings and facilities were over in the front part of our Ford operating base. The gate was just beyond that. And a, a, there were a few articles written about it uh, back here in the United States after the attack too, but there was a 10,000 pound dump truck bid. That means they took a dump truck and they filled it up with homemade explosives. Mm -hmm. they, they broke through the gate and uh, that platoon wasn't, uh, try to describe this. Uh, so when the dump truck bid had come up, came in, the dump truck bid didn't try to hit the US convoy. He was going directly towards the Iraqi army headquarters where their leadership was going to be and the adjacent barracks that was going to be there. But our our striker platoon had seen it, had engaged it, had uh, killed the driver, but not in time for the driver to have gotten to the building. What happened a few minutes later is uh, it was remote, not a few moments later, was it was remote detonated by a different mm. person. We learned this later on that it was remote detonated, but. Uh, I had been right behind the striker platoon and there was an one, the explosion uh, was incredible. It was, uh, there was a, kind of this shock wave that goes through when you're, when you're right next to an explosion that large. And we came up on it in their vehicle. Uh, they had the, the, the VBIT had hit one of the, the striker platoon's vehicles, knocked it on its side uh, you know, the turret had been blown off and it was on fire and it wasn't, we, we started to medevac them. And then what we realized is there were about 40 Iraqi army guys that were in the building that was hit by the VBID too. So we started eva uh, evacuating all the Iraqi army guys. Uh, we started assessing the situation with the U S soldiers, uh, that were hit as well. And my weapon squad leader had seen, a guy moving inside of the vehicle and he said he was going to go get him. And I told him, I didn't think that he was, um, that he survived. And my weapon squad leader said he was going to go in and get him anyway. And so I couldn't leave. I couldn't let him go in alone. So we both went in through the roof of the vehicle and pulled this soldier out uh, through the roof and, uh, you know, medevac him and, and the, the rest of his team, but a blast that large, um, you can't survive that. And, and so all of the U.S. service members had been killed. You know, there were about a dozen Iraqi army officer, I'm sorry, uh, soldiers who had been killed too. And I mm. think about 30 wounded in the incident alone. Wow. So it was, wow. it was a pretty chaotic day. Yeah. Uh, I, di I didn't think we deserved any, any awards. Uh, what's interesting about that is when you receive awards, you're like, that's weird because like, there were lots of other crazy shit that I did, you know, that, that, you know, nobody ever notices or does. And so it's like, that's weird that that's the thing that they give you an award for when you end up doing, uh -huh. you know, that I didn't not, survive anyway, huh? 
No, he didn't, unfortunately. Yeah, but sad. I'm glad that, um, you know, it, I'm glad we were able to, to get him out before before the uh, the fire took over the vehicle. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would you say is the most accurate war film um, about you know our conflicts in the in the Middle East? Or one that you like, I don't know. Um, oh, um, to be honest with you, uh, I don't watch a lot of war films. Uh-huh. I watch like Band of Brothers, uh, Saving Private Ryan. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. They they lost their like entertainment value for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I really, I'm, I'm trying to think. But really, I, I haven't watched. I mean, I watched Lone Survivor, which, you know, good entertaining, but that wasn't like my experience. I was, yeah, you know, we we're an infantry platoon living in in Missoula. Um, but yeah, let me, let me think about it. I'll get I'll get back with you. But I, honestly, it's it's a product of me not watching war movie or modern war movies either. Yeah, yeah. What uh, what caliber did you carry? We had, uh, you know, we have our our five five six i had my my m4 is that what you mean and then we had uh the m9 nine millimeter pistol at the time so i was like fortunate that we had the m4s as opposed to the m16s because i did run into a few marines who were still carrying around m16s mm-hmm. even in 2008 and 2009 and uh and i had an acog on on my m4 too so i was uh it was nice to have an optic i had gone through all of my training things like that on iron sights so to show up and get get to pick one of a, a few different optics was was pretty nice and then yeah the m9 and there's nothing special about that but it's it's uh dependable mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um have you since your time out of the military have you ever entertained uh you know actually going hunting yeah, no, I've been hunting a few times. Okay. Uh, go pheasant hunting in Kansas with some some buddies of mine in St. John. Friend has a family property up there, so uh, gone up there. Uh, they're open season in in November mm-hmm. a few times. There's some pretty good dove hunting in Yuma, so we'll go out there. And then my the first rifle i ever bought was at fort benning georgia it was in between schools and i had a uh, a few buddies who were hunters and at the time i think they were given 25 or 50 dollars a tail for killing the the wild pigs out there because they uh-huh. were feral and so we're like oh this is a good way to make some beer money like you know and the in between schools it's like a, a nine to three day right they kind of give yeah. you a little bit of time to to you know, reset and relax a little bit. So we just go out there in the afternoon, maybe have a beer, you know, uh, go hunt some pigs. So I've done a, a little bit of hunting. Wouldn't say I'm, you know, an expert by, by any means, but I do enjoy it. My favorite thing is just being out there in the nature and the quiet. And you have kids. I have, I have two girls. Uh, and I feel like that's what you end up appreciating as you get older is the peace and quiet. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I mean, these days they're, they're always beat me up to take, to take them with me, which I'm, you know, I love doing that too. But then you have to teach them about, Hey, part of the beauty of this is the, there's no devices, you know, we're not on our phone the whole time or on your iPad or whatever. And we're just, we're looking, we're observing, we're being a part of this scene that we're currently in. Um, so trying to instill that in them as my, uh, my dad did in me. Um, dove hunting though, that's, that is completely different because it's such a, a such a, a social sport. You don't have to be quiet, you know, um, I, it's, it's a holiday here in Texas for us, for my family, the kids don't go to school. They know they're not going to school on September first, uh, so it's a it's a big deal, and they absolutely love that experience. My son actually shot his first dove last year. It took him thirty five shots, but he finally got one. <laughs> a box and a half of shells. Uh, we we brought the the kids out there too when we went to Yuma, and and it is a fun family event. We had a nice uh, barbecue and made you know like jalapeno bacon 
poppers out of the mm-hmm. out of oh yeah it was great uh the girls you know just uh, i buy i bought them both uh rascals you know the the bolt action 22 for mm-hmm. us to learn on but uh, and we go, we, there, there's kind of a big shooting event that I go to every year on New Year's, like 30 or 40 people go out to the desert in Arizona, have a good time. My, my girls, like they'll shoot for a little bit, but that's not what, what entertains them and, yeah. and gets them going. So that's why it's like, you know, maybe they will be more into, into fishing, which mm-hmm. they have enjoyed in the past too. And you, do you do a little bit of fishing then? Just you know, when a friend wants to go out and fish, like we went and, and visited my buddy who's still out on active duty, he was stationed in uh, Savannah uh, in Georgia. And so we went out and we went, you know, fishing a couple of times out in Savannah. We've gone around Arizona out to Lake Pleasant. Uh, For bass or what? That's a really good question. I'm not 100% sure what we we're fishing. It's more <laughs> like, hey, we're going to go out on the boat. We're going to throw some some lines in the water. Drink some beers, yeah. Drink some beers. And then also, you know, uh, don't know we're fishing out there either, but on Fort Benning, you can rent pontoons in Georgia, uh, Mm. right, right uh, on the, on the Chattahoochee or the the inlets to that. And so we would go out there on a regular basis too. Yeah. It doesn't sound like y'all were doing much catching though. We're just hanging out. It really is, right? You got, you got some Mm. music on, drinking a few beers, you know, throw, throw a line in the water and. Yeah. but um uh, definitely not so i did read in your bio that you played golf and soccer in uh in high school so obviously soccer you've long had to uh, have given that up can you still swing a, a golf club though with the back fusion yeah i can um you know i haven't talked to you know like doctors or physical therapists about uh you know, which sports I, I should and shouldn't be playing, but I really, I love golf. Uh, I, I got into it. Yeah. Like I said, in, in high school and it, it's, it brings me the same sort of enjoyment that hunting and fishing does. It's, it's getting out there, uh, and, and enjoying the, 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 the outdoors. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, when I was a kid, I played, football my my parents got divorced pretty young so my mom had figured i needed to get some of that energy and and stuff out and so i played football for about six years got into high school and uh weighed about 150 didn't make the team figured i'd just go back and and try out my my sophomore or junior year started playing soccer started playing golf just kind of got into those mm-hmm. and never went back to football yeah Right on. What about you? Uh, so the reason why I'm like dealing with these hernias and and potential back surgeries because I still play soccer every Monday night in a oh, nice. in a men's league, but I I haven't played in three months because I had the her the the hernia repair surgeries, and I went back and tried to play one game and was like it feels as bad as it did before I got them fixed. So I don't. That's why I'm waiting the uh awaiting the MRI just to see what the heck's going on, but trying to figure it out and but the doctor was like if you have the fusion you're, you're not playing soccer again so i also like to play pickup basketball games at the gym yeah um, i like to do that too anything other uh, than running on a treadmill yeah i agree i don't think i'll ever be able to play soccer again but at this point um i need to have my knee replaced too and i'm mm-hmm. just trying to like slow these down right <laughs> if i'm being honest so i also have a fake hip and so i'm like if i could if i could just prevent these and also uh surgeries are still risky and Mm -hmm. and i'm like i've got half a dozen of them in my future like i don't i don't don't know so i'm trying to slow roll them but what they told me is the only thing holding my my left knee together is the pcl and so i even when i was watching gymnastics i was like i could just imagine my legs snapping in half if i (laughs) I like the idea of going back out on the soccer field Right. And like I was watching soccer, obviously, during the Olympics, too. And it, my brain won't even let me imagine, like, you know, uh, juking or, or doing the, the kind of lateral movements the way mm-hmm. that that uh, young people do. I can't even imagine being able to do that. And that was part of my frustration, to be honest with you, is I was in my you know mid 20s 
and I was having injury after injury. And I'm like, this is so frustrating because you watch, I'm not saying I'm a professional athlete, but it's like, how do these guys keep taking the beating that they do, Mm -hmm. you know, day in and day out. And, um, you know, why, why are mine becoming so, so bad and like catastrophic for me so quickly? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's just the way life is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it did feel a little bit like I had just gotten into, into the pros played one year and then got hurt. And like, I was like, I, I, cause I, you, you pour a lot into getting that far in your career too. And then you're like, Oh, well, I guess that was it. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so post military career, you went back to, uh, ASU went to, to law school and then t- talk about this. Um, you were working with a, an advocacy group and then there was a, a scandal, a VA scandal in 2014. When I went back to law school, I'd reconnected with a friend of mine who had also uh, gone to law school and was an instructor of mine at ROTC. He was still living in Arizona. He was a le- little bit involved in policy and politics, not much. He was mostly uh, you know, focused on his, on his legal career. And, but on the side, he was helping this veteran advocacy organization. And he knew I was looking for a job. I went to law school after having a wife and a child. And then we had our second daughter while I was in law school, which I wouldn't recommend for anyone. That doesn't like make it any easier. But he had said, hey, well, well why don't you come and help out? You could be like the Phoenix director. Uh, it won't be full time, but I want you to organize veterans like yourself. Uh, talk to them about you know what's going on at the VA and things like that. Within a couple of months, the VA scandal happened in Arizona. The VA scandal was about patients dying on waiting lists, and then on they were kind of uh, the VA bureaucrats were creating secret lists to keep track of the appointments that they were pretending were being had and weren't having, and so it blew up. Right, you had senators you know calling VA. Uh, directors into uh, uh, to Washington to testify to talk about how how did this all happen? I was in Phoenix like during the VA like the Phoenix VA scandal, and I happened to be running this uh, this organization. So it gave me the opportunity to go around and listen. So one of the big things I did is go to VA town halls and listen to veterans and listen to their issues and you know what they think the right solutions were going to be. Uh, we would organize veterans to do a number of different events. Uh, we held a press conference when President Obama came to, to visit the VA. We uh, organized hundreds of veterans to go lobby in Washington, D.C., where we went and talked to every member of Congress uh, over the course of a week about the changes we wanted to see at the VA. Uh, and it's really has become kind of the passion of my life to work on on VA and and military issues I've brought in a little bit since then but yeah it was all the VA scandal and me being in Phoenix when I was and just getting out of the army and looking for something to do while I was in law school well and it directly affects you I'm assuming most of these surgeries that you've had or will have to have will be through the VA yeah they have Mm -hmm. I have seen an improvement in the VA, if anyone wanted kind of an update since the VA scandal. I think that there's more room to grow. I think that there are some some truths that we should accept. Uh, the, the amount of patients that every primary care doctor is seeing is outrageous. And every time, now, when I go in to see my primary care doctor, it's almost like I'm reintroducing myself to my doctor. I have to remind her while I'm there, like what has happened to me, who I am. Mm -hmm. And and I, and, and that is a perfect example of, I think the, the biggest problems at at the VA. Um, But I have seen some improvement and it's led to, I now serve as a commissioner on the veteran advisory commission that oversees the Arizona department of veteran services. It was uh, a, And appointed by the governor and you have the the VA director answer to the commission 
Um, and so I'm able to, to give back in that way now too. So it's, um, it's continued to be one of my, one of my passions is working on veteran issues and helping. Hmm. So when you were deployed, did you pick up smoking? I, no, I wasn't smoking, but I dipped a lot. Okay. Uh, like I said, there was this big transition. Uh, and there was a time where our new combat outpost was two and a half hours outside of Missoula on the uh, Iraq-Syria border. So when you go out there, you do three, four days of missions, and then you turn around and you drive back. But by that time, you're exhausted. And so you got to find things to try to keep yourself awake. And I'm sitting in the command seat of, of my Humvee all the time, right? But you are just driving in the desert for two hours, and it's really easy to fall asleep. So I thought you'd find this funny. Like, we would do these competitions. We'd be like, how much dip can you put in, right, to keep yourself <laughs> awake? I'm sure you've done that. Shoe where you horseshoe it around. But like, it was just impossible. But um, I, that's kind of a good example. It's like tobacco becomes – part of like the culture and what you're doing too. And, and it's staying alert and staying alive. And like, um, it's also a, a de-stressor too. I remember after missions thrown in a dip and some guys getting a cigarette out and us kind of just walking through our AAR. And, um, and so, yeah, I did, I, I dipped pretty heavily for about 15 years. It was difficult to quit, but, um, I've been using, I use the, the, zin, uh, the, uh, the nicotine pouches to, to get off of, uh, the, you know, the hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of smokers have, have found success in, in the vapes and in the pouches too. And so that is another project that I'm working on is just through my own lived experience of being able to, uh, to get off of the more dangerous tobacco and nicotine products and transitioning. I used to out love Copenhagen. The Copenhagen long cut. What was your Copenhagen uh, snuff favorite? was my favorite, but I, I didn't really describe as long as it wasn't like, I didn't like the flavored, like no mint or wintergreen, none of that crap. I just want it to taste like Copenhagen, but it's been, I haven't had one in over three years, uh, but I don't, I wasn't ever addicted. It was kind of just like this okay. thing I did when I was hunting, which was a lot, but I wasn't, I would like, I wasn't sitting in my office working in this here in the studio dipping, but if I was in the truck or outside, mowing the yard, whatever. I probably had one in and I was, and really it was my son getting older. I was like, you know what? I don't want him to see me doing this. And so I just was like, it was uh new year's day. And I was like, I'm just taking it. And I threw that can in the trash and I haven't, I haven't had one since. So, uh, but I never, I never get the craving. So I don't think I was actually addicted to it. It wasn't, I didn't have like withdrawals or, you know, experience any of the real negative stuff. So I guess it wasn't, I wasn't dependent on it. But, but man, I enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and you know, I'll throw in a, I'll throw in a dip every once in a while just yeah. to enjoy it. Um, I was definitely addicted. Once I started using the nicotine pouches though, now, you know, I'll throw one in every once in a while, but it was almost like that, that, that addiction had, had faded away. And so now yeah. I like throwing in every once in a while. I enjoy it. Um, uh, but it, it did help me to get off of, uh, my regular use of, of Copenhagen long cut, which was, was my go-to. Uh -huh. Um, so, but we do have a problem in this country with these, like you said, tobacco was just part of the culture and it was something that was a crutch to just get, help you through, you know, to help you through the, the trying times the long days, uh, long hours, um, things that most people don't ever see or experience. And these guys come back, and they continue smoking. Obviously, that's not a good thing. Uh, first, from the uh, the the health side effects, and um, we have a we have an organization now that you're involved with called Smoke Less Vets. And so, talk about how you got plugged in with that, and what and what we're trying to do. Yeah, Smoke Less Vets. It's a great organization. It's a bunch of veterans like myself. Uh, and what we, what we identified was we thought it was kind of a failed strategy. The Veterans Administration mostly pushes out outdated methods to help veterans quit smoking, um, like counseling, cold turkey, 
those aren't the most effective ways. I can tell you, like I said, from my own personal experience that mm -hmm. uh, using alternative products is a, is a good way. And so what we want to see is, is a new approach uh, to helping veterans transition off by including resources and education about these different, uh, maybe more responsible ways of, of quitting smoking. Uh, so we're at smokelessvets.org if you want to check out some of the, the information. What you're going to find there is that there's a huge portion of the veteran population that wants to quit smoking, over half. And, you know, of those, uh, of those veterans who uh, want to quit smoking, most of them have tried before and failed. And so what we're trying to do is introduce a new solution that can be more effective at, at, at helping our veterans. And we think, you know, that helps with force readiness and, um, and the veterans health as well. So we think it's an overall really positive and good campaign and something mm -hmm. the, the VA and both the federal and the state levels should embrace. So why haven't they? I think it's a really good question. Part of it is uh, maybe change is always difficult to make within the, the VA or the bureaucracy. Uh, I think that there's also this stigma that, um, you know, we want to end smoking and, and end the use of, of tobacco products. Um, and we don't want there to be alternatives out there. Um, and so is this an idea that like, um, you know, we just want to end the, end the industry and, and stop people from doing it altogether? I think that that's part of it because that seems to be their strategy in the past. Um, but I do think we can make an impact and we can get them to embrace a, some, some different ideas. Hmm. My, I've uh... noticed like... Um, I've been working in, in, in this area. One of the things that I've noticed is there are organizations out there uh, who don't want to see policies like this implemented. Uh, they don't want to see anything that seems to uh, you know benefit the tobacco or the nicotine industry in, in any way. And so uh, that unfortunately blinds them to, to positive policy changes like this too. Mm -hmm. My my grandfather picked up smoking while he was deployed in England in World War II, and he lived to eighty one, but he struggled with that his entire life, and ultimately he he died of complications. Like he got he got pneumonia, and then the doctor was like, "By the way, I think he has cancer," but he was you know at this point he was too far gone to save. They're like, "We could do a bunch of um you know scans or whatever." But he's like, "Really." I think his, I think he has lung cancer. Um, but I remember as a kid, like he'd either, he'd smoke a pipe or he would smoke cigarettes and he tried to hide the cigarette smoking for a long time. You know, I think I was in high school when I, I finally realized my grandfather smokes a lot, you know? Um, but yeah. well, I'll, I'll send you these too. If you want to, you know, put, put them in the, in the post or whatever, but vape products are 95% healthier than, than your traditional cigarettes. Mm. And so it, to me, think about the huge impact that we could make if we transition all of those people who are smoking, all those veterans, especially too, because these do have negative health impacts too. And I think that they do actually impact force readiness. And there are studies out there about oral, oral care and, and the problems that it creates there. And so one, we're having recruiting and retention problems within the military already. So like, you know, just making your force a little bit healthier so you're not also losing soldiers in that way, I think um, is a benefit to them. But I think also knowing the science out there, knowing that uh, you you can help people transition and they can still, you know, enjoy a little bit of, of the, the nicotine that they like. It seems like a win-win a to me. Mm -hmm. Um. So Smokeless Vets, that's the name of the organization. Uh, if you know a veteran who's struggling with nicotine addiction, I would shoot that over to them. Uh, let's let's talk about another thing that you and I are both passionate about, and that's Vote for America. We yeah. have uh, a big deal, a big election, I think. 
I don't know how this country comes back if we elect that woman, uh, Kamala Harris. It's uh, And it's so funny to me because here we have the Democratic Party who for, well, I, I mean, we knew Biden wasn't mentally there when he ran. And it's it's not as bad as, I mean, it wasn't as bad then as it is now. He's obviously degraded, but that's what dementia does to you. Um, and they were they were going to elect that guy again, knowing that he was a puppet, that he that he can't function, can't do the job physically or mentally. And at the time, Kamala's approval rating, even among Democrats, was like thirty eight percent at its highest. Nobody likes her. Nobody liked her. Now, three weeks later, everyone's like, Kamala is the the person for the job. Let's this is great. She's the best. And I'm just like, wait a second, your own party only. One third of you liked her less than a month ago, uh, but it, she seems completely incompetent. Like you can't take her serious because she isn't a serious person. When she's when she's speaking, her crutches just start laughing about serious topics. It's but the gaslighting from the media right now is absolutely incredible. And I wanted to ask you though, being uh, an Arizonan, I don't believe that Carrie Lake lost that last election. You had. Katie Hobbs, the attorney general overseeing the election. And you're going to, I mean, she was hiding in her basement while Carrie Lake was playing to packed houses. So what is up with the Arizona political landscape? Well, that's a loaded question. I mean, Arizona has been ground zero for so much what's going on uh, politically, whether it's like the election integrity fights or, I mean, you've obviously seen what's going on at the border and that's had a huge impact. We have lots of migration, you know, we're constantly one of the fastest growing cities in America. So I think if you take all of those things together uh, and and not to mention you, you, you add in COVID too, it creates an environment for for chaos and i think that that's what exactly what you're seeing uh mm -hmm. here in arizona um look like one of the things that i i really want to see and this is what vote for america is all about is is getting military veterans or family members but, but even beyond that to get like-minded individuals like like you and myself uh, who care about hunting, who care about their Second Amendment rights, uh, who care about you know their their privacy. That, look, we've got to we've got to register these. We've got to register to vote, and we've got to turn out to vote. And so one of, that is one of the things that I'm going to point out that you're seeing in Arizona is that people are getting so turned off by what they're seeing in politics. Uh, you know that we're that we're having lower turnout, and especially in in certain demographics. I think that that we could solve that problem. Arizona is a Republican state. Uh, statewide, I think re Republicans have about a 250,000 voter registration advantage in Maricopa. I think it's 70 or 90. There's no reason that Republicans uh, shouldn't be winning across the board. Uh, but they need to they need to turn out. I think um, one of the things that we've been uh, you know, trying to to advocate for is, as well is uh, a trust in at least the early voting process, which I know is is somewhat controversial, but that's how Republicans won in Arizona for a very long time. And so uh, we may be leaving votes on the table um, if we're not embracing things like that. But you're right, it is. It's it's wild out in Arizona. You saw our attorney general, uh, you know just released updates on her case against uh, the electors here in Arizona. So there's no uh, small amount of kind of political warfare going on uh, here as well. And I think that voters are tired of it, to be honest with you. I think that they're, they're ready for a change and they want, um, they want to go back to having leaders who love their country and, and want to see uh, the best for them. Mm -hmm. I agree. I did not, I don't know. Um, it was also interesting to watch uh, Kamala pick her VP, and yeah. the guy, what his name's Tim Waltz, I think, from Minnesota. And you're supposed to look like you need to be like a good-looking person. That's kind of part of the the 
the criteria. People don't want to admit that, but I mean, look at how JFK won, right? Look, Obama, yeah. Obama, Obama's a handsome guy, right? Um, now, uh, well, I guess Trump maybe isn't, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but Pence was, and this dude is just a fat, bald, old white guy. So to me, it says, I I think if the leading like the front runners would have been Whitmer or, you know, um, Gavin Newsom, Shapiro. Shapiro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, to me, it says the cupboard was bare and that some of these people didn't want to attach themselves to, you know, a losing horse. That's what a lot of people are saying in Arizona too. You saw Mark Kelly, fighter pilot, astronaut, right? Like good resume. Mm -hmm. You think uh, his wife, Gabby Giffords was, shot uh, an act of political violence when she was a member of Congress. I looked at it, I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense to me. You're like, why wouldn't you pick this guy who's got all these, you know, great credentials? Yeah. And then, but, and, and, but so like, you know, what we've been discussing is, yeah, Mark Kelly probably didn't want that job, right? right. Like Kamala Harris, whose first job uh, as vice president was supposed to be in charge of the border. She goes down there, clearly makes it worse, right? And then we pretend she had nothing to do with the border. Yeah, right, just like watch the, remember, that's the gaslighting that makes me so yeah. disgusted with um, uh, American media. It's like, wait a second. If you watch CNN or MSNBC, they're claiming right now, today, and have been since you know Biden said he's not running. Ka Kamala was never in charge of the border. Literally, yes. Joe Biden said, you're the border czar. Go fix the border. I know. Sent her down to South America, right, to the, to the triangle, and was like, made the problem worse. No, I remember when that was happening and i remember being like this is ridiculous like um i remember her defying it she's like she's like i'm not the border czar i am the immigration czar and i'm like mm. nobody nobody cares fix the problem right and you only right. made it work and what we've seen in arizona not to go down a rabbit hole but it is why i'm so passionate about registering you know our type of people to vote because you should see the stats on how few hunters vote um and how few veterans vote It is half of what the, the civilian population that votes about 26% of veterans vote that are registered about 60% of, of your, your ordinary citizens do. And so anyway, what we're seeing down here is we watched like uh, very clearly how, bo how Biden's border policies were making things much worse. It's our communities that are seeing 5,000 people come into Arizona every single day. Um, I've been down to the border half a dozen times, and if you think it's not already, um, I'm trying to think there is the right way to say this. Um, there is like an unwritten agreement between like the cartels and border patrol and what's going on down there. You see the, the footage, these migrants are lining up in the morning at the same spots, uh, and, and that's, you know, efficient for the border patrol because they don't have to drive up and down the border all day, like collecting all these people. Um, but they're all being led into the country, right? Yeah. They're all being processed in. Nobody's stopping them from coming in, right? And so then I wonder why are they welding holes through the wall so that they could sneak in? Why are they like camouflage out in the middle of the desert when literally if you just walk up to a border patrol agent and say, hey, uh, I'm seeking asylum. They're letting you into the country, right? right. And so, so it was very frustrating to us is you've seen over a million gotaways, right? That's what the what ICE is calling, uh, you know, the, the people who sneak into the country that aren't being processed uh, through. And we've over, had over a hundred people on the terrorist watch list who have been caught. And mm -hmm. so, like, how is this not a national security problem? That that you know, you have no idea who's coming in. You have no idea. It's, yeah. so it's, you know, it's scary. So, like, that's the type of stuff that we're dealing with here in Arizona. And I want to. Well, same in Texas. I mean, my buddy, of course. Uh, he has a ranch that's probably like 30 miles from the border. He just finds dead people on it, like that died of heat exhaustion that were, you know, trying to come yeah. across. Uh, people's ranches destroyed, you know, because the, the, the cartels, <clears throat> their coyotes will just drive through the fences with these people. Yeah. It makes sense. No, yeah, I mean it's it's becoming very unsafe. And then there's there will be yeah. a, a environmental disaster. There already is because the amount of trash in the Rio Grande where these people are encamping coming across, it's it's horrible. 
It's absolutely, it's a travesty. Well, I think Governor Abbott's doing a good job or doing everything he can. Yeah. Yeah. So good for him. Which is weird because he'll like be like, okay, we're going to try to secure this because you're failing at your job. And then Biden will be like, we're suing, we're suing Governor Abbott for trying to do the job we're supposed to do. So they did the same thing out here. Uh, I've got I, yeah, I've got pictures. I wish uh, you know, we could share. I'll I'll send them to you though. Uh, so you know we're building this wall, um, which uh, let me share also this this interesting fact. Uh, did uh, one of my first tours on the border with with one of the county supervisors down there, and as we're rolling along, he's like, uh, "Well, you could tell." where each president section of the wall goes and he's like that's clinton's over there and that's w bush and like that's obama's and then it like clued him i'm like wait hold on like these democrat politicians who are like i'm against the wall all of their all of the presidents have built sections added sections to the wall so this idea that they politicize like just putting up the physical barriers like where the physical barriers should go especially if they they prevent um vehicle traffic or if they you know anyway my point is is like there's lots of practical solutions that that we could apply and the fact that the democrats were like so anti-wall and then you find out that obama built part of the wall too yeah i just there's like some irony there that i think is so funny and his his is a little bit fiercer than george w bush's side of the wall which i also thought was kind of funny it's got like the razor wire and george w's doesn't have razor wire Mm. so you've got this um I, you just watched as uh as these politicians uh kind of i think abandon common sense problem solving uh for politics and it's yeah. impacting the whole country now and that's the that's the the thing about trump the derangement from these people it's like you were going to vote for i crap my pants again guy uh over trump because you hate Trump that much, not because you love your country. You're just a never Trumper. Like, okay, I get it. You know, Trump's not the most tactful, nice human being on the planet. I don't want my politician to be nice. I want my politician to have a backbone and say, you know what? Here's my middle finger, China. What do you, how about that? You know, instead of as soon as soon as Biden took office, the first thing he did was jump back in bed with China. It's like, I don't, I don't want to be dependent on the rest of the world. We shouldn't as a nation. We should worry about ourselves first. But it seems like that, that side is, is, I mean, I always just describe them as America last. Like, why are we, why are we letting? My, I have a buddy that lives in uh, New York City. And he said entire city blocks are boarded up. Businesses closed because there's just migrants just hanging out everywhere. And crime got so bad. That the business is all just like, well, we're not like Walgreens even can't do business. It's not safe. We're, and we're losing so much inventory to theft and then we don't prosecute criminals because you can steal up to whatever X amount of, uh, merchandise value is like California. It's uh, $900, I think. And then they don't, don't even call the cops unless it's more than $900. What, what kind of a world do we live in where law and order isn't enforced? Um, so I don't know. I think as even blue cities see their, their, you know, economies, their way of life, um, quality of life diminished. I think even they're going to start to wake up. So I don't see, I don't know. It's a, we'll see how good the media does at, at gaslighting Kamala to potential victory, but that's the only way she can win because nobody honestly believes her, her policy continuing with this disaster that Biden has left us with is going to be better than Trump. And life under Trump was better than life under Biden. So, I mean, look at our bank accounts. Yeah. Well, you know, I I didn't think that that Walls was the right was was the right pick. Like being objective as like a campaign person and what would have even helped the Democrats most. Uh, so maybe we uh, will benefit from that. Uh, conservatives and Republicans will. Um. It does seem like they're making it up as they go. No, I don't. It doesn't seem like there's some grand strategy to this all. It's mm-hmm. just, uh, you know, one one mistake after another. I think that uh, Americans want to see 
strong leadership back in the White House. I think that they want to see uh, common sense policies uh, in, in Congress, too. A I man is we... a man. A woman is a woman. That kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I really feel like we got to get back to the basics. We need to get back to the, the foundational principles that made this country great. And and anyway, I, I think that, you know, your viewers can be here and listeners can be a big part of that. Helping, yeah. helping us register more people to, to vote and get the word out to help our soldiers be healthier. Mm -hmm. So Smokeless Vets and uh, and it's is it dot org? Smokeless Vets dot org. Smokeless Vets dot org and vote for the number four America dot org. Yeah. And also follow Vote for America on on uh, social media because they have you you won't believe the the level of influencers that they've they've got involved with that campaign. It's uh yeah. people care and and big big, big names care. Uh so more than just guys like you and I. Um so let's get out there and make a change, take this country back. Um Matt, I appreciate it, man. It's been great getting to visit with you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for your service. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Uh, let me know, uh, you know, if there's any hunting opportunities too. Love to, I was stationed and I, I forgot, totally forgot to mention that. I was mostly stationed at Fort Hood in Texas oh, okay. too. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And that's, that's where my pig hunting story was from. I was going to say, just, yeah, there's lots of pigs out there. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go get some beer money. Yeah. Maybe that's what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> right on brother well i appreciate it all right thanks cable